everything, everything, Lord, you are everything to me, everything, everything, Lord, you going to have, they are all going to come from you. So we put you in center stage. We acknowledge you as our source and we give you thanks. At a time when things are rough and many may become indignant, many may even question your faithfulness and your relevance. Lord, we call back to mind that you are the one who's been with us all through the times. The tough times, you were there. The good times, you were there. When both were side by side, you remained there. And so, Lord, we are mindful to come back to you today and to give thanks to you and to give you praise and to accord you your rightful place. Please accept our thanks in Jesus' name. As we go into your word, I'm asking, Lord, for open heavens over this place. Those on site and those online, let everyone have open heavens to receive from you. I'm asking for the door of utterance. Ask that you speak through me like never before. I'm asking for that the hearts of every hearer, viewer, will be receptive to your word. And I pray that your word will have free course to bring about that which you have purposed. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. You may please be seated. Thank you for your warm welcome. Mr. Sylvia is somewhere at the back there, lifting up my hands from there. I don't know how you are dealing with these times. And I don't know what's going through your mind. But as I sought the Lord's face, I received a word of encouragement and a word that's supposed to, that I'm trusting God would. Because it, shall, it changed my own theology a bit since God's been showing me a little bit of this. And I could not help but go back in time. I think I was under 10. I'm not sure of the exact age. But we were living in what used to be called Wakeman Street in Yaba, Alagomeji, specifically. And all of us on the street, I mean, if you remember, see, it's still, well, they've rebuilt some of the houses. It's now called Bonue because they've linked about three of them all the way from Butemeta to Sabo, and it's all Bonue now. But it was a closely knit and very diverse community. But one day, and I think we, I can't remember if it was weekend or whether we were back from school. The serenity was shattered because there was this elderly woman who lived on the street. Number, don't let me bore you with too many details. She screamed. And of course, everybody ran in the direction of that place. And we found out she had just lost her only brother. And what stuck with most of us was her words. That God can't exist. God can't be fair. He can't say is this if he will take her brother before her because she was older. 
and the circumstances of his death, another drama that I won't go into, but it stuck with me as a young person. Ooh, of course, with the time I was raised, you didn't question elders, you didn't question authority, you just knew God was God, whether you, didn't, you knew God by yourself then or not. Of course, it was later I would know God for myself and by myself, and I can relate with God. But as at that time, whatever they taught us in the school, wrote memorization, you just regurgitated it. God was good, God is good. Don't question God, otherwise thunder and lightning will come. <laughs> but it stuck with me because one incident in her life, and I don't know if she made peace with God before she died. But of course, since then, 50 plus or there about years after, I have met many people in life because of one thing that they felt what they were disappointed by God or in God or God didn't come through. They redefined the relationship. How many of you have been disappointed by God? Don't be too sanctimonious. Don't be too religious. God didn't come through for you the way you expected. And you are not happy. How many of you have ever gone to him? I pay my tithe. I serve you faithfully. I fasted. I seen myself. Mm -hmm. As if you can bribe God. As if anything you do is what's going to make him. Anyway. But I've come to realize that in life, there will be twists and turns. That in life, there will be mountaintop experiences and there will be valley experiences. I think it was in Job. Whether it was Job himself or one of these <laughs> with friends like those ones. <laughs> Poor comforting friends. But they were good friends. At least they were with him. But they just didn't know to. Sometimes all you need to do is just be there with somebody. You don't need to say anything. Bring food. When they are just saying, hmm. But don't try to become God's attorney and start twisting theology and trying to defend God. And Job was like, and you people don't try it. Anyway, when God came, God did not use the same approach as them, Abby. And God taught them that next time, just be there. He's rolling on the floor. Roll with him. He's crying. Cry with him. That's comfort. Your presence is enough, but don't try to be Jerubal. Don't. God does not need defense attorneys. He doesn't need a lawyer. But I think it was in Job that they said, can you receive good from the Lord and not receive bad as well, even though their theology... And I know that I grew up for years always thinking, you know, also wanting to put God very... Look, God can do whatever. Some things he does, they will come across as bad. When we reach there, we will, under, we will ask some questions and understand some things. But we know that God is ultimately good. He doesn't do evil. But the consequences of some of our actions are going to be bad. And of course, we'll say it's God. Just like insurance people say, act of God. Maybe God do our more. But you know, we, are, we attribute everything to God. The devil will do some bad, bad things. We'll say, now God. It's God's will. Take it like that. But I understand why people say that to an extent that anything that happens is because God permits. And God permits for different reasons. We will not always know. We don't know what some ancestors sowed that we are reaping in our own time. We don't know why some seeming evil thing is allowed to stave off a bigger one and then for something better to come later. And I will show you one or two examples in the Bible because I'm not here for philosophy. Anything that we cannot hinge on the word, just throw it into some dustbin and say, this guy is just a motivational speaker. But thank God I'm not one. So there are twists and turns. There will be mountaintop experiences and there will be valley experiences. And I always thought they come in turns. How many of you think like that? And they tell you when you are at the height of something, be careful because something bad may just be coming. And it often happens like that. But God has taught me in my own life and from what I've seen in listening to him download, that not only do they come, but I've seen them happen more side by side. Hello? They happen side by side. You are the mountain top in your finances, but you are in the valley with your health. You are the mountain top in your... Uh, at work, and you are flat 
in another area. Every year, I mean, when I set goals for myself, I don't set yearly goals anymore. There are about three to five year goals now. I have seven areas of my goals. Spiritual, number one. That's my intimacy, my walk with God, being his child. Ministry number two, like this, what we do for the kingdom and in the kingdom. Number three, family. Because my family is priority. After God is family. In fact, ministry comes after family. God first, family. Then I have social goals. Because I'm a social being. It's not just my family. If it's only my family, that's selfish. I have to relate with the rest of you and other people. Then I have professional goals. Because work is where we spend most of our lives. If you are not deliberate, intentional, <laughs> they will roast you. You'll just be on the receiving end. How many are those? Five? Then I have financial goals. Because money answers all things. <laughs> if, you don't have, if you don't know how to, where to send your money to, it will go wherever they are calling it. And it won't be where you want it to go. So you have to learn to invest. Final one, health and wellness. Even though God has graced me, they say I age in reverse. I look closer to 50 than 60. Glory be to God. But I still have to learn a few things and invest. Small exercise. I don't do too much, but I do a bit. When I find I'm not sleeping well, I have to set back into equilibrium. Drink enough water. These days, two liters, they had me. I don't know why. But by fire, by force, when I'm tracking, and then it reach night, I say, ah! But then, if you don't drink it early enough at night, you will make a visit around three or four o'clock to... Anyway, so when I make the goals, I set the goals, I find that sometimes that five of them in those five areas, everything is looking good. And then it might be in the professional or another place. This your hall is very cold this morning. No? I see some people are, the way they are looking, the, please, technical, help us with the cold. Because I don't want the cold to distract some people from receiving this message. Hmm? Help your neighbor. <laughs> I find out that five out of the seven all's good going well and it's not because I was slack on my own but somehow God has not allowed the answer to manifest how many of you know how easy it is to define your well being your existence by the one or two things that haven't come through and you become ungrateful or your gratitude is glossed over mechanical and you are focusing on that one you want to fast and pray and everything but nothing yet what are you going to do and that's the title of my message it's the same god sorry i know they advertise the fear of god of the lord that's not what he asked me to come and talk to you about but maybe by the time we discuss it's the same god uh, eventually the fear of the lord will increase in some of us mm -hmm. and i found that it was very tempting if you're not careful you become so engrossed so focused on that area. There is, a, there is something I've been trusting God for for 10 years in one of those seven areas. Sometimes I'm like, God, if it's not going to be, sure you will remove the desire. But for as long as the desire is in me, and he says he gives me the desire of my heart, which when I look at that scripture, I always interpret it in two ways. The first one is that he gives me what I, I mean, whatever I desire he will give me. The other one is that at a deeper walk with him, I will only desire what he wants to give me. That means I will only, it's what he puts in my heart that I want to desire. And if he puts it in my heart and I desire it, then I know he will give me. But 10 years, oh boy. And I can see others are getting the same thing and more. But then when I want to become unduly indignant, I have to remember how long did it take Joseph to get his dream to rule over his brothers. How many of you knew he couldn't rule over them in the house? That's why he had to be exported to where the throne will be bigger. If not, he'll be one small local champion. But he had to go there and become a regional champion. And how long did Abraham wait? 
to get his first child, even the one that he arranged, not the one that God provided. But even with the arrangement, how long did he wait? It took him a while. It was about 90 when that one came, and about 100 when the real child of promise, Isaac, came. But how, long, how old was he when God first promised him? Bible scholars will have us know that he, I think he waited about 25 years. How many of us have waited 25 years for something? But do you know how many things we've asked God for, forgotten about because we felt he's not going to answer? You've stopped praying, and yet one day it surprises you, the answer just shows up. And I remember when God taught me that from Isaiah, he said, you see, my word that I speak, it will not return to me void. Until it will answer, that word will be hanging around you on the earth. Me, I had forgotten some things. Oh, I didn't pray for them. And then suddenly, they show up. I'm, I'm like, huh? Faithful God. And yet, there are things I've been praying for. If not every day, but at least once a week. Even when me, I want to give up. My, my wife and children, I remember, we will pray about them. And I look and say, Father, Lord, is there anything too difficult for you? But despite that particular area not yet manifesting. I see him consistently in six out of the other seven spheres of my life. And I'm seeing fantastic testimonies in those areas. It's the same God. In Exodus 20, 23. Exodus 23. we learn about what I'm talking about. How the same God provides and makes a way for both what you might call a problem or a challenge and the grace or the solution. I found out also that God can do things instantly. There are instant miracles. When he was going to deal with the Egyptian army, he was instantly at the Red Sea. When he was going to deal with Jericho, Seven days, but when eventually the walls collapsed, instantly they went in. But then we get to this Exodus 23, and God told them something strange. If you look at verse 24 to verse 30, we won't read it all. He said, look, Exodus 23, 24 to 30, he says, I'm bringing you in, but I'm not going to clear all the Canaanite nations for you in one fell swoop. I'm going to do it gradually. He said, because if I clear all of them at the same time, and you occupy the place, there will be too many wild animals you'll be contending with. But you see? And I'm like, ah, ah, but God, can't you clear the wild animals too? There's something wired in us where we want God to do things for us instantaneously. And we want our solutions once and for all. And God is capable and he does that sometimes. Oh, I've seen solutions at work where God will just clear the road for me like this. I've seen solutions in life relating to my wife and children where God will clear. But then I've also seen those that he's dealing with them progressively. And I'm like, Pukwa, why? Because it's human nature. You want to go in autopilot. Because he did it like this last time, he must do it like this this time. How many of you noticed how many people's eyes the Lord Jesus Christ opened while he was in his earthly ministry? For some, he laid hands. For some, a spot. For some, he pasted mud. Why couldn't he just speak each time and the eyes be open? If he spit on you, if I spit on you to heal you now, how many of you will put me on social media? <laughs> and then, the rest of you will be criticizing me till tomorrow, but the person whose eyes are healed will be smiling away and say, glory be to God. You say, how unhealthy. How undignifying, how demeaning. Couldn't he do it? There must be something occultic about it. And ask God. But he would do it different ways. It's the same God. So God told them, I will do this progressively. Sometimes if things go too fast or too smoothly, take it from me, fresh troubles will emerge. Please write that down. If things go too fast at times or too smoothly, Fresh troubles will emerge. 
How many of you at 15 wanted a Ferrari and if God gave it to you, you would have handled it well? You go crash. And probably end up in the hospital, Igbobi. With one leg dangling to the west and the other one to the east. And the, I once went to pray for a friend's son. Six foot tall, every inch of muscle guy. But he crashed. And while he was lying down on his hospital bed at orthopedic hospital, Ibobi, none of that six-foot, six-pack glory was of anything. We prayed. Eventually, he passed on. I think he gave up the will because he, he would rather die, maybe, than to become... Because he was full of life. In 2 Corinthians 12, 7 to 10, and for months God was teaching me on this scripture. But just a little we'll look at today. Mighty Apostle Paul. And I know people have interpreted all kinds of things about what is done in the flesh. was, But I think in one of the edition versions, it makes it clear. It said a servant of Satan who went about dealing with me. And Paul had dealt with situations. Python girl, come out of her. This one, that one. He was used to dealing with things instantly. But this one, he said three times. Only three times. Because Paul is not used to praying, was not used to praying more than once or, or even twice for the same thing. Three times I went to the Lord. He had such confidence in the Lord that if I go to him, as he says in First John, um, whatever verse, he says, if we ask anything of the Lord, you all know that one, don't you? Uh -huh. That we don't doubt. If we ask, come to him, he will answer us. You don't doubt him. He has integrity. But Paul said, I went three times. Can you imagine? I even bothered the Lord three times. And each time he told me, my grace is sufficient. Just accept grace. The day I caught the rema, I started respecting everybody named grace more. But grace is not passive. Grace is very active. Nothing you do except by grace. Everything is by grace. And the grace of God is a very powerful and active force. He said, my grace is sufficient, but that's not enough. He said, my strength is made perfect in your weakness. If I may have it in TPT on the screen, I want us to look at it, and if possible, also a message after. Because this is where, and then by the time I mixed it up together, and not NKJV, please. I said, TPT, you... Please help me. If you don't have it, I'll pull it out from here. Do you have it? Anyway, to summarize what I got from it, the Tunji version, is that your weakness, that problem, that challenge, becomes the portal. You know what the portal is now? Uh -huh. The doorway, the opening, through which God's power is going to express itself in its fullness. So if I'm not weak, for as long as I think I can fix this issue, for as long as I think I got it, I can sort it out in my own strength, God is just going to do like this and be looking at me. You got it? Go ahead. And I can tell you, there are things I've struggled with. And I struggled with them whenever I tried to use human wisdom and my own ability to fix them. But the times I've received victory from them are the times that as soon as they reared their head, I just said, Daddy, something for you to do, box. Please help me out here. If you don't help me out here, well, I did. But guess what? Yesterday's victory does not guarantee today's own. You might have conquered the bigger demon yesterday. And if you think you're going into autopilot, it's going to happen in your own strength, or you don't pray, or you don't turn to him, you find yourself scrambling for dear life the next minute. That's what Israel found out. They finished Jer Jericho, and then when he came to Ai, they said, ah, we don't need to send the whole army, just send a few, 7,000 or something. <laughs> Not knowing that something had gone wrong in the camp that left them, and I dealt with them. And the scary thing was if one small one can deal with them and the news goes to everybody else, that everybody else will be taking them to the cleaners. So they, they did the right thing. They cried to God. They went back to God. 
when we deal with issues, we must know to go back to God. That's what God was telling Paul. I'm not going to yank this thing out of the way. The problem is going to be there. But every time the problem comes, my grace is even going to be there much more. The weakness is going to be there. But as you depend on me, my strength will come in increasing force and numbers and magnitude than ever before. I know you don't like that because I don't like it either. Ah, God, why can't we solve this one and remove this one so that another one can come, we can deal with that one. Why must this same thing continue to linger? It's the same God. Why are you dealing with that one and it's progressive? It's still sorting out in other ones. But in this particular one, why? He's the one who designs the curriculum. He knows what is going on. He knows why he permits it. He's developing the curriculum. We are in a hurry. We are often in a hurry and our approach differs from God's own. I don't want to repeat class. Thank God I never did. I came close once. I played too much. But I think my father was calculating money more than showing me. So he just said, behave yourself and go on and thank you. The ones we want, somebody before me had been made to repeat. He said, you can't go to school sat like this. You have to be better prepared. In my own case, I escaped, get out of jail card. And I did well. I didn't fall his hand. But none of us wants to repeat class. But we have to trust God. If he allows the class to extend, it's because he knows much more than us and his ways are by far better than ours. So you notice that not only does he allow progressive deliverance at times, but he allows both the problem and the solution to exist side by side. He didn't clear all the nations for them in that Numbers 23. He didn't clear all the beasts at the same time. He allowed them to be there side by side. In Paul's situation, both the weakness and the solution side by side. The weakness and the grace. The trouble, the weakness, and the strength side by side. Maybe you thought, I'm not spiritual enough. Maybe you've thought I need more fire praying and fasting. Nothing wrong with those things. But perhaps what you really need to do is sit down with the Lord and say, Father, what's going on here? Let's amplify this. Let's illustrate it even more. In Numbers 21, there's a strange story. And it's going to shake some of us, our theology. Numbers 21 from verse 4 to verse 9. It says the people grumbled. Oh, you this Moses, you brought us out of here. The bad, the bad, the bad, the bad, the bad, the bad. They became irritable and as they traveled. And they complained. And God was angry because he knew it was not just Moses they were complaining about. It was really him. And what, how did he punish them? He sent snakes after them. Not just ordinary snakes, venomous snakes. The Bible didn't just say snakes appeared. He said God sent the snakes. And as they were crying and dying from the pain of the snakes, God called Moses. He said, okay, get somebody, make a statue or a nominee of a snake and put it on a pole. And go and erect it somewhere in the camp that most people can see it. As well. That sign of medicine today, that's where it came from. If you know the sign of medicine, there is a serpent on a pool. That's where it came from. And God said, anybody that is beaten by the snake, he didn't say wassail, that is beaten by the snake, when you go and look at the bronze snake, you will receive your healing. I read that thing in the past tense before. I thought it was the first bite. But lately, as the Lord was teaching me and I opened my eyes, the snakes did not leave the camp in a hurry. So, some people were beaten more than once because this their mouth could not stop. Eh. So, Moses now, you don't reach to the put pole for Kenny, this God. Now, wow, when you did manna, the same manna they complained about. So, for each time they did, they were beaten again. And the longer it took them to move, to, because if they were far away, they couldn't see the pole. If there was a tent blocking their view, if there was a mountain blocking their view, they needed to find their way there. 
If they were crippled, they had to cry, help me. If it was a baby, the parents had to run. Because the baby wouldn't know how to look at They had to turn the baby's face like this. That's how some of us are. Sometimes God has to allow us. Things have to get rough. We have to learn. We have to, but some of us are hard of hearing. And we are slow learners. So sometimes four, four bites. For some, ten bites. But guess what? The serpents were in the camp. The healing remained in the camp. Side by side. And the people too remained in the camp. It's like he said, I've said before you blessings and curses. Choose blessings so you may live. But if you prefer curses, eh, you will reap the fruit of the... Side by side. Same God. They grumbled. If you want healing and stay alive, you needed to look at the pool. Forgiveness does not eliminate the consequences of the offense. He so said, these people, they knew they caused their own problem. And they cried to Moses, oh yeah, pray to God. That's when God now said, do this one. So they knew, and they could attribute the, cons the snakes to their grumbling. Many of us sometimes have cannot tell the problem and the, and the cause. We now start saying it's village people. There's no video. The people in the village are peacefully minding their business. You are the one that caused your own problem. But you see, God is merciful. He will forgive. But the forgiveness does not eliminate the consequences of the offense. If you look at David and Bathsheba, <laughs> and this is where it gets more interesting. You can't figure this God out. But the best we can do is to trust him walk closely with him and obey him. David coveted his friend's wife. Both him and the friend's wife committed adultery. Both guilty. But he more guilty because as king he was in a stronger position of power. Then he alone committed murder to cover up the evidence of the adultery. He tried trickery because the woman got pregnant. Wow. And he brought the man in, especially from the war front, to come and <laughs> feel fine. But that one had a higher order of nobility. He said, how can I feel fine when we are dying in the forefront and my generals and co? The guy probably suspected too. He says, I wasn't born yesterday. This David, I know him now. <laughs> hey. Anyway, God's judgment fell on both of them. In David's case, God said, the sword will never depart from your household. I did a study that God taught me. Twelve things that came out of that circumstance. Starting with the baby dying. That's the first judgment for between both of them. The child, the product of that adultery, died. Then later you see Ammon and Tamar. You see Absalom killing Ammon. You see Absalom plotting coup against David. You see Absalom being murdered. Later you see Adonijah versus Solomon. Several things that happened in David's lineage because of one one nice stand. One hookup. Mm. God will help us. God will really help us. It's not easy, but it's not impossible with God. I'm not trivializing it because so much is out there pressurizing us, men and women. But remember, <laughs> The, where the problem is, God is, has the solution there at the same time. He's the same God. For Saul also who persecuted the church and who presided over Stephen's death, even when he became born again and God was God that brought him, his forgiveness did not eliminate the consequences. All the persecution that came in his ministry was harvest. The law of harvest came in. That's why God now says, okay, son, my grace is more than sufficient. You are reaping, you know, but you will come with the grace. But now let me cheer you up. And I'm not encouraging you to go and do something bad and think God will treat you the same way. But all I know is that in the midst of all of this, God can still bring great things out. Look at David and Bathsheba. 
the second child they had when he now properly married the widow. Youngest child of his turned out to be the one that he said God loved. There is nowhere written that God loved any of his other children. They didn't say God hated them, but somehow God didn't name love them and God didn't name any one of them. How many of you ever noticed that God gave Solomon a different name from the one we all call him by? God named him Jedidiah. Just like Daniel had two names. But we know them by the other popular ones. He said God named him. God not only named him, God said this is the one that will succeed you. Hello, big brothers that are almost the age of his own, that are old enough to be his father. They had all been lying and waiting. What he to said. But everything was upset. And, but God just came and said, this one, product of questionable relationship. And guess what too? Youngest wife, Bathsheba, latest one, her last one to enter. Not Michael that was hard coin coin. Not Abigail that saved his life. But Bathsheba, former adulteress, is the one that God elevated and became queen. And sat. Because if you look at all of it, there is no account of Abigail coming into the court and they set court for her. Or Nathan the prophet aligning with her when it was time. Sometimes I don't understand this, our daddy. But I, I know it means well. So what are the odds? What drove these elections? What drove these choices or decisions on God's part? Paul, who came last as an apostle and a former persecutor of the church, became the one sent as apostle to the Gentiles. And who probably had the most fun in ministry and ended up writing the majority of the New Testament that we are all still reading till today. What honor. And let me end up by saying this. Psalm 119, verse 67. Psalm 119, 67. Let's read it together. Psalm 119, 67. Before I learned to answer you, I wandered all over the place, but now I'm in step with your word. Now, let's have this in NKJV. Let's have it in NKJV. Before I was afflicted, I went astray, but now I keep your word. So what now makes him to keep his word? I know. Let me tell your neighbor. What made him to keep his word? Eh? What is a modern word for affliction? Hmm? Punishment. Basbos. What else? Eh? Wahala. For some of us, we won't really take God seriously until something brings us to our knees. For some of us, if everything is instantaneous, we are too forgetful. We're just waiting for the next one. Because we are being conditioned in today's world to think yesterday's news is old news. We're looking for the latest trend. We're looking for the latest hit. We want and all of that. We don't really even sit down on the message of one day and brood on it and really run with it. We've switched channels. You know, because we've been conditioned. Too many channels to plug into. Too many social media platforms. For some of us, it's time to unplug. Go on a fast of social media. On fast of things. Just so that you lock yourself in a room with God. And say, Lord, I don't know why this thing is lingering. But I, I, I suspect that it's going to linger until I learn the lesson that I need to learn before you promote me to the next class. Because until you pass this class, you're not going to the next one. And God is saying, I still got you. I still make sure the sun rises on you as well as naughty people. I still make sure everything is going on well with your health. But you see in this one, in this relationship where you're struggling, and it's not about fighting and praying for them to fall down and die. It's not going to happen. I don't keep people like that. It's because I want you to learn something. So, that's worthwhile for us to focus on. I'll leave you with that. James 1.4 It says, let patience have its way and let patience do its work. God is calling some of us to that place where we really need to surrender. And he's saying, I'm the same God. He's the same God at work. It's the same God that's giving you instant results here. And in these ones, you're going to have to depend on my grace more than anything else. 
I pray we will listen. I pray we will hear. I pray we will obey. Pastor Ayo, 